divine truth feedback. Jesus, Mary and others give personal or group feedback to people who have asked for personal assistance. Jesus and Mary give personal feedback to Sandra Tazinska on the subject of love compensation, repentance, forgiveness and prayer. The feedback was recorded on the 1st of December 2015 in Wilsdale, Queensland, Australia. This is part one. Hi everyone. I'm Mary Magdalene and I'm here with Jesus and we are filming another of our regular personal feedback sessions today. And today's session comes from a forum post on the Divine Truth Hub forum mm. and it's from a lady we know well, Sandra Truzinska. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so We don't know how to spell, spell, pronounce her last name well. <laughs> yeah. It's a, it's a good uh, cultural education <laughs> doing these sessions because I have to pronounce everyone's surname. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, so I'll just read it to you and then we'll go over the points sure. involved. Sure. She says, Hello, I'm just translating the truth about the law of repentance and forgiveness, which is a previous talk that we've given. And Jesus speaks about how this law is for the willing soul and that the law of compensation acts upon a soul that is in resistance. I'm wondering whether engaging the law of compensation, which I assume is the desire to feel the pain we have caused to others and ourselves, can lead us to engaging the law of repentance and forgiveness. I'm just starting to realise the fact that all the pain and suffering I experience is a result of things I have done and do that are harmful to others, so I am aware that I am experiencing the law of compensation. However, I'm still unwilling to embrace the law of repentance and forgiveness. But can I engage the law of compensation, as in embrace it, by being willing to accept that it is operating on me and allowing the painful effects of breaking the law of love to be felt? Mm. It seems that the two laws are very much related. Is it correct to say that engaging in the engaging the law of compensation, we are willing to acknowledge and feel the sin, and thus it is the first step in moving towards the law of repentance and forgiveness. Sandra. Hmm. Well, Sandra, there are some things you're saying that are true, but there's also some misunderstandings there, so we'll try to clear them up in this feedback session. Yeah. Um, Perhaps what we need to do first, uh, after we thank you, Sandra, for doing the translation, like, and probably we need to thank all of our translators yeah. because they all volunteer a lot of time. It it's of all of the jobs to do, it is one of the most difficult things to do because uh, to a degree, you be, need a bit of a soul-based understanding of what you tr what's trying to be said in English exactly. before you can translate it into a soul-based understanding of another language. And then on top of that, there, in, in many languages, there's not the wordings um, that are available to us at, uh, in English mm -hmm. to describe different conditions. And so many translators then have to come up with a slogan or word or, or a series of words which often has an effect of distorting, of course, the translation. So we know it's a very hard job. And in the end, it's something that we would probably like to speak the language rather than, um, and that way we can personally share the truth in those languages rather than having people having to translate them all the time. Definitely. It's great that Sandra's asked the question because it's going to deepen her understanding. Correct. And it will help her the translate answer. the material much better as exactly. well. Exactly. So, yeah. so thank you for doing the translating, all you translators out there. Yes. Um, but before we really answer her question, I feel we need to understand some basic things about God's laws. Now, some of these basic, most of these basic things we're going to mention are available on our website under the introduction section. If they look at the pull down called God's Laws, they'll find many of these points. But let's mention some of them, mm -hmm. um, you know, so that we can understand. And we're not going to discuss these principles in detail because we want to get to the point of discussing the law of compensation in a bit of detail in comparison to the law of repentance. So, so we'd like to just mention some basic things and uh, discuss some of those things about laws generally and then lead into the conversation about the law of compensation and the law of forgiveness and the law of repentance. Yeah, mm. yeah. So perhaps what we need to do first is start with what God's laws 
are or do yep. and we'll start at that point and then we'll work our way through. Now we've made some notes and so Mary is going to read out each point and we're going to have a brief discussion of each point and then we will go through more detail about the law of compensation and the other two laws of divine love, the laws of repentance and forgiveness. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so first point we need to note is that all of God's laws are loving. Yes, <laughs> and most people don't believe that. In fact, if we have a look at uh, how most people feel about God, they feel God's a, a, a vindictive, punishing God, and they feel a large degree of confusion about why they have personally so much pain and suffering. And in fact, whole religious systems have been developed in order to somehow mitigate the confusion. <laughs> and many of these religious systems, unfortunately, add to the confusion rather than taking away from the confusion with regard to what you know what is the major cause of pain and suffering yeah the first thing we need to understand of course is that god is love um, therefore therefore all of anything god creates is love and therefore all of god's laws are loving and therefore any penalty that's invoked by the law must also be loving yes so we, we need to understand that firstly yeah yeah okay next point is that god's laws form the framework of the universe mm. and allow for the human to create within the confines of law. Yes. So, so we need to understand that God created law because God is not an anarchist, <laughs> doesn't <laughs> believe in anarchy in God's universe. Everything is orderly, mathematical, scientifically orderly, and that includes all of the laws are all orderly. They all have an orderly function. And we need to understand that God created these laws so that we have a loving framework within which we can create personally. Mm. So God enabled us to become creators in our own right. And, uh, and God not only enabled us to become creators, but through the gift of free will, God enabled us to create both good and evil. Yeah. And, uh, and in fact, all evil that exists in the universe is the result of humankind's creation. Mm -hmm. And by humankind, I'm also referring to all of the other Earths that have humankind on them as well. Yeah. So, so the, all of the evil that exists in the universe is the result of the creation of humankind acting out of harmony with law, with yeah. God's laws of love. Yeah. 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 And that's a really beautiful thing, I think, that God did that allow the laws actually allow for us to create. Yeah, that's a, that's a pretty cool. Imagine if we couldn't create, it would just be a pretty bland. Well, it'd be existence. robotic, wouldn't it? Yeah. In the end, it'd be one. It's one of the functions of being a sentient, uh, free will, free thinking being yeah. is to the ability to create. Of course, giving us the ability to create also means that there's the potential for us to create things that are out of harmony with what God created. Mm -hmm. And God's universe and all of God's laws allow for that to occur, actually, yeah. which is a very loving thing if you think about it. God created a whole series of law which allow us to create things that are unloving, if that is our choice. Of course, because it's in disagreement with God's laws, there are natural penalties that result from creating so, something that's unloving. And this is what we mean here about uh, allowing the human to create within the confines of the law. Yes. There are penalties and there are limitations. Would well, you when say you say limitations, limitations, the irony of the laws of love are that if you create in harmony with the laws of love, there are no other limitations. Mm -hmm. But when you create out of harmony with the laws of love, there are very many limitations, mm -hmm. which include, in fact, such things as pain, suffering, disease, and many other problems that we experience as humanity on, on the earth in particular, but also in the lower spheres of the spirit world, are the result of our desire to create out of harmony with law yeah. and, and, the, and therefore reap the, benef the uh, penalty of, of such creations. Yeah. yeah. But we must understand that all evil that exists is our, or collectively, humanity's creation. Mm. It is not God's. Mm -hmm. So that, that's another thing we need to understand about law. Very important, mm. yeah. Okay, next thing about God's laws. Mm -hmm. They're created within a hierarchy mm. of laws which govern the universe and everything in it. Yes. So the hierarchy is quite clear. We have physical laws which govern our, everything in the physical universe. There are what you would classify as metaphysical or sp spiritual laws is what we often refer to them as in the spirit world. They, they 
control everything in the spirit universes. You could think of that universe as sort of dark matter type universe. So, so you can think of the physical universe as the matter we can see, mm -hmm. and then the spiritual universe as the matter we cannot see. So dark matter, and they are a whole heap of laws that govern the operation of that kind of matter. Mm -hmm. Then there are a number of laws that govern what you would classify as the human soul in two layers. One, the yeah. first layer is the human soul in terms of its ethics and morality, mm -hmm. and they are classified as the laws of natural love. Yeah. And the law of compensation, which is the purpose of this discussion, mm -hmm. fits into that group of laws. And then we also have the laws, the higher laws of divine love. And and those laws also operate upon the soul, but upon the soul's ability to become divine. Mm -hmm. And those kind of laws are the kind of laws that include the, the laws of forgiveness and repentance. Yep. Mm. So you've gone through the hierarchy there. There's physical, yep. spiritual or metaphysical. Yes, or you could think dark. You know, there's matter. Physical is matter. Yep. And, and, and spiritual is dark matter. Yep. yep. Then we get on to the laws of natural love, which are about morality and ethics. Yeah. Now these primarily. laws govern the soul. So these yep. are these are laws that are sp specific to the the human soul and its own creation and its abilities. Mm -hmm. Yes. And then the laws of divine love, being yes. the highest laws that we're currently aware of. Yes. Yep. And these laws govern the development of the human soul in, into divinity along with uh, such issues as, as immortality and other very important issues mm -hmm. for your future. A lot of people don't <laughs> worry about it very much now, but they are very important things to understand in the long run because they have a large effect on your happiness. Mm -hmm. yeah. So Sandra's question is relating to these two sets of laws governing the soul. Yes. One nat is the natural love law of the law of compensation. Yes. And the her second part of her question is about the law of forgiveness and repentance, which is one of the highest laws that we're aware of. Yes. Of divine love. It's a part of the class of laws regarding divine love mm -hmm. and, and therefore part of the class of laws that govern our long-term future happiness and well-being. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Last point about what God's laws, uh, about God's laws in general, yes. is that breaking these laws causes chronic physical, spiritual, and emotional sickness and disease. Yes. So, so there is the soul has the ability to get sick. Mm -hmm. The spirit body also has the ability to get sick, and the physical body also has the ability to get sick. And breaking laws, particularly the two groups of highest laws, so the laws of natural love and the laws of divine love, all cause physical, spiritual, emotional and soul-based sicknesses mm -hmm. and disease. And, and much of this disease it becomes chronic in the sense that it's long-term, has a very long-term long detrimental effect, not only on ourselves, but also on others of humanity for long periods of time. And in some cases, some of these uh, some of the penalties have, have continued for hundreds of thousands of years. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when we look at the decision of the first human couple, for example, on this planet, um, that decision has, has affected humanity for, hun for, for over 150,000 years. Yeah. So, so these laws can have long-term detrimental effects, not only upon yourself, but also on the rest of humanity that follows after you, because of the nature of the law and how the penalty is exercised upon the soul. Yeah. So, so it's very important to understand that if we wish to improve the happiness of the human race, we have to at some point come to a very clear understanding of God's laws. And this is one of the reasons why I've studied God's laws for such a long period of time. Yeah. And, I, and I recommend that any person who ever wants to become one with God to would need to actually engage themselves in a study of God's laws and in particular the laws relating to the soul yeah and the other laws of course become understandable very clearly once you examine the laws relating to the soul mm. because there is that within the hierarchy isn't there once you understand one of the higher level laws within the hierarchy you have you immediately have uh jurisdiction if you like jurisdiction over the lower laws or yes. or your engagement with those laws those higher laws either means that you don't need to engage the lower laws or and in some cases don't even need to know them yes yes yep. so 
So this is something we also need to understand. Yeah, mm. yeah. Okay, <coughs> some things that God's laws are not. Yes, very Number, important Very, very important. Mm. Number one, they are not arbitrary, mm. inconsistent, indiscriminate or randomly applied. Yes. Rather, mm. yep. all of God's laws are perfect and predictable in their application. Yes. God made a universe humans can trust. Yes. Imagine if God made a universe we couldn't trust. We could walk outside one day and we'd be stuck to the ground and we couldn't move because gravity had now increased 20 times and we couldn't handle it. And then, uh, you know, we walk outside the other day and we fly off the earth. Because, you know, that, yeah. that, that's a physical law that changes. Obviously, none of that would make any sense for our <laughs> happiness because we'd be, we'd be totally confused all of the time. And, um, and that, you know, is something that God doesn't want to create. You know, God mm. doesn't want to create our confusion. God wants to help us understand the universe in which we live and make it consistent and, and uh, predictable. Yeah. If we look at the different things we said, though, arbitrary, it's not arbitrary. What, what were the other words we used? Um, inconsistent. Inconsistent. Uh, so one law, the same law applies to everybody. Yes, and it's important for people to understand that if two people have got cancer and it happens to be cancer of the left breast, then it has the identical cause. Yeah. If two people have a brain tumor and it happens to be in the exact place, exact same place, then it happens to have the same cause. Mm -hmm. If two people catch the same disease, um, you know, if whatever that disease may be, yeah. whether it's a, a, a chronic one or just a virus or something like that, they all have the same cause. Mm. So, so you can see that if because of this predictability of law, it's quite easy to cure them and actually cure them en masse, cure them for everybody, yeah. as long as we understand the law. So yeah. there are huge benefits to understanding the law, not that understanding that the law is not arbitrary. Well, if we think about even medical science, which I don't believe actually has the answers to curing long-term illness and disease, so. yeah. but on some level they have understood some of the laws governing the physical body, yes. which is why that they can administer Our the same drug, drug or, or, treatment. or treatment to various people from various walks of life and have the same, the result. same result. Yes. If it was unpredictable, you could imagine the chaos yeah. of life generally, yeah. but also it would be it would feel like a very unfair life and very fearful. Uh, <coughs> fearful, I would think, because the, the, the you would go about your life wondering what's going to happen. Happens next. To you next, yeah, yeah. Because and you'd have I, no idea what might happen to you. If next. I do this thing today, one thing might happen. If I do the same thing tomorrow, another thing might yeah. happen. Imagine it's, the imagine the terror of it. Yeah, it would be terrifying yeah. life. And, and obviously, being emotional beings, we would be quite distressed yes. by, yeah. by the terrifying yeah. life that comes from an arbitrary application of law. Yeah. So it's very good that God, you know, it's a loving thing that God didn't create law to be arbitrary. And it's interesting that humankind basically believe God is arbitrary. Yes. And, and obviously that's not logical given the fact that all of the physical laws are not arbitrary. And those physical laws, even the laws that govern the repair of our own physical body, are all consistent. Mm -hmm. so, so there's no logical, there's actually no logical or scientific evidence that God is arbitrary. Yeah. In fact, there's quite a lot of evidence to the contrary. Exactly. So, so, yeah. so it's very important that we understand that, that God's laws have a nice consistency to them yeah. and predictability to them. And we, they can't, which also means they can't be manipulated or, yeah. or, or you know, diverted. Yep. They, they must be adhered to. There's and no special court of appeals. <laughs> no, no. And so, so that also has advantages in terms of justice, in terms of, you know, if two people have the same disease, for example, God is just. God's not applying the disease for one reason in one person to another. And when I say God is not applying, the law itself applies it. Mm -hmm. And it's our desire to break the law that causes the disease in the first place. So we need to understand that. If we understood that, we could cure all disease. Yeah. We could cure all sickness. We can cure all pain and suffering, whether it be emotional or spiritual or physical. And, and you imagine a world living like that, it'd be absolutely amazing. Yeah. So just understanding that one principle can give us some confidence in God mm. and confidence that we have the ability to cure everything. We, we just don't have the desire to do it yes. yet. Yes. That's all. Mm. Okay, next thing that God's laws are not. Mm. They're not punitive. 
Rather, they are educational and redemptive. Mm. The laws educate each creature about its own limitations within the universe and also operate to bring all of God's sorry, operate to bring all of God's universe, including the human soul, into harmony with a condition of love. Yes. So we need to understand this basic principle that God's not trying to punish you. <laughs> God's not trying to make your life hard. God not, God's not trying to make you uncomfortable or, or make you suffer or any of these things. Even when the penalty of a law is applied, that was not God's purpose for the penalty. Mm -hmm. The purpose for all the penalties of laws are redemptive and allow us to see our limitations. Yeah. So in other words, the human body, for example, has a limitation that it needs to breathe oxygen. Mm -hmm. So obviously, a lot of God's laws support that. So by making, for example, um, gravity and oxygen able to interact with each other so yeah. that we can, <laughs> so all the oxygen that's on the earth doesn't fly out into the universe, for example. Just basic physical laws support our own existence. Mm -hmm. And these laws all operate in concert with each other. And that's how physical existence can come can remain on this planet, even. Mm -hmm. And, and so we need to see that actually God not being punitive, not, being a de not having a desire to make us suffer for no reason, causes, uh, causes the, has created these laws to show us that actually there's something happening here that's out of harmony with love. And, and all of God's laws are for the purpose of redeeming us into the, into the harmony again with love. And, and we need to understand that if mm. we're going to truly understand the operation of any of God's laws. Yeah. So even the law of gravity, for example, a physical law, has loving consequences. And if it wasn't operating upon us, would have, we'd have terrible and loving consequences to the human body. The majority of us, for example, would not survive on the earth longer than a few seconds once we were born if we weren't confined by gravity. Mm -hmm. And... And this is why the law of gravity is such an important law physically to understand. Now, in terms of the understanding of the law, um, not much was really understood on this planet until the 16th century or so about mm. the law. And, um, and, and, you know, obviously things develop further and further on from there. But, but even now, we don't understand everything about the law. No. And, and, we, and, you know, it was only in the, in the 19th century and the, and the 20th century that we've begun to understand principles of gravity with regard to relativity and things like that. So, so you can see that the discovery of many of these laws from a human perspective, whether, whether we know they exist or not, they still exist. Yeah. And all of these laws uh, have, this, have the concept that they are all loving and they are all trying to lead us somewhere. Yeah. They're all trying to lead us into a condition, a, a loving condition, a condition that benefits our happiness. So you could say they're all about educating us in love. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. And once you understand that, you will understand every law, even the physical ones, much better. Yeah. yeah. There's a whole heap of properties of the physical law of gravity, for example, that many scientists still do not understand because they don't understand love. Mm. Yeah, mm. powerful. Mm. Okay, next thing that God's laws are not, mm -hmm. they're not enforced by God personally. Mm. Rather... Each law has been cleverly designed to ensure its own enforcement. Whether the law acts upon our physical or spiritual dark matter mm -hmm. or upon the human soul. Yes. So, so this is a, another important principle to understand about law. You know, it, it's, it's such a beneficial principle too. Mm -hmm. mm. So if you just read the first part of the sentence again. So God's laws are not enforced by God personally yes now this is something that most people don't really understand they if they believe in god they believe that god's up there enforcing every single thing you know yeah. personally yeah if they don't believe in if they they if a person doesn't believe in god at all obviously they don't believe god enforces anything yeah. um, and there is a tendency still though to believe that the law is arbitrary right in other words it applies differently under yeah. all different sorts of circumstances and if i have a certain personal prayer to god then i'll personal god will personally intervene really and remove the penalty of the law yeah or if we're a non-believer we if we ignore the law that it means it's not there yeah <laughs> and that's not true either <laughs> so so we need to understand that god god is not personally god's cleverer than that god hasn't personally 
having to manage every single day, every single hour, the operation of every, and every minute, every second, the operation of every law upon every one of God's creatures and all, upon all matter. Yeah. You imagine <laughs> how difficult that might have been if, if, you know, in terms of what kind of a maintenance nightmare it would be. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is exactly, this point exactly reminds me of the way that we try to approach things in that whenever we create something new, a new system or a new even a physical thing in our house, we try to create it so that we don't have to spend time maintaining it or if you apply it yeah. to the laws, enforcing it so that there's more energy for further creation. Yes, and the more in harmony with God's laws we become, the less management we will have, the yeah. less maintenance we will have to perform as yeah. well. Yeah. So, you know, many people water their gardens, for example, every week um, or every month or whatever, uh, well, we don't water our gardens at all. Um, and, the, and the main reason why we don't is because that's not in line with our policy, basically, <laughs> to not waste time maintaining things. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> now, obviously, that means that some things die under certain circumstances, but once our soul is in the right condition, that won't occur yeah. and we'll be able to see that difference. Yeah. So, so even when it comes to physical things, it's pointless maintaining things over and over because what happens is that you get to a point where your whole life is full of just maintaining things mm -hmm. and you no longer have the ability to create. Now, God doesn't want to limit, want to limit God's own ability to create. So God's mm -hmm. always wanting to create new things and God doesn't want to limit God's ability to create by having to maintain a whole heap of things. Mm -hmm. so, so God cleverly designed every single law so that they are self-maintaining. To, to me, it is just, I just love this about God's laws, that yeah. they are, it's such a good design. Yes. And they're reliable, they're always operating. Yeah. God doesn't have to, over, nobody has to oversee them. No. Nobody even has to have a judge or a juror or anything. It's all happening and God set it up. Exactly. In, from the beginning. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. It's awesome. It's a wonderful system. Yeah. And uh, when you understand it, you, you have to admire the intelligence <laughs> of the creator, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> And obviously, uh, such a system wouldn't have come about without intelligence. Yeah. So, so that's a very important thing to understand that God's not there, you know, in, like some kind of controller managing everything. Yeah. God has created laws that are self-managing and self-maintaining, and that leaves God free to do things that God wants to do, which, yeah. which largely are about educating and, and helping all of his children to grow in love. Yeah, mm. yeah. Okay, God's laws are not secretive. Yeah. <laughs> Rather, God has made a system of laws that can be easily discovered by humankind if the will of any human is exercised to do so. Yes. So, so while at the moment, for example, the cure to cancer is unknown by humanity generally from a scientific perspective or medical perspective, the reality is that God wants to share the cure with humanity, mm -hmm. but God doesn't have the ability to do so because of humanity's choices. Humanity doesn't want to see that the cure is related to soul-based, love-based injuries and, and not related to some kind of chemical or, or some kind of physical imbalance. The physical imbalance is the effect of the soul-based injury. Yeah. And God wants us to see such a thing. So this is what God wants. God wants to educate us and help us see things. God's not secretive. God's not trying to hold back on us. Um, God wants to share everything mm. with us. Mm. And all of God's laws can be discovered. They can all be discovered, the whole lot of them. Yeah. All the ones that even we don't know about at this point can be discovered yeah. if we have an effort to do so and if we have an open mind and heart. Because an open mind is not enough. An open mind doesn't open our emotional state yeah. to love. And it's through love entering our soul that we'll begin to understand most of the universe because the universe has been created from a God of love mm -hmm. and, and, and all the God's laws are related to love. So it makes sense that if we are detuned from love, that we will struggle to understand God's laws and God's universe. Yeah, yeah, mm. yeah. Okay. Now some points that apply to all laws. Mm. First one, all laws exist and are operational all of the time. <laughs> <laughs> yes, this makes sense, right? Because, you know, obviously the law itself is a framework mm -hmm. and, and a framework must be in place for it to work. Mm -hmm. A framework must be in place 
100% of the time. It can't be 99 or 98%. It has to be 100% of the time. So this is a very important principle for us to understand. All the laws are operating all the time. There's there's no cease, no cessation to them. And this is, um, we'll talk specifically about Sandra's points earlier, but she was talking about can I engage this law? The, the law is always happening. Exactly. Whether yeah. you choose to engage it or not engage it, at the end of the day, it's still happening to you, whether you know about it or you don't know yeah. about it, whether you're in denial of it or not, whether you yeah. think you know everything about it or you don't, it's still happening the, exactly the way it is. And there's nothing you can do to change that. <laughs> yes. And another thing I hear people say often is, oh, the law of attraction really ramped up for me here. And no, it didn't. It never <laughs> ramps up. It's always consistent. It's always, yeah. It never ramps up or goes down or ramps up or goes down. These are all sort of statements people make, not understanding the basic principles, but also believing that God somehow punishes them or, yeah. or gets back at them. You know, no, the law doesn't ramp up. The penalty may, depending the on pe- how much we break it. Yes, the penalty may. <laughs> and the happiness will too, depending on how much we live in harmony with exactly. it. Exactly. <laughs> And our awareness of our attractions, for example, can can grow. Or of course, but it doesn't change the law itself. That's what I mean. The the reason people might the, feel like it's more attractive. We could have chosen awareness at any time and exactly. therefore had that awareness. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. there's no ramping up of a law or the no. degradation of a law or yeah. the non-existence of a law. They all all the laws exist all the time and they operate all the time. It's just they operate under certain conditions yeah. and we need to see the conditions, conditions. Uh, that affect, you know, there's conditions that affect the physical, conditions that affect the spiritual matter, the dark matter, conditions that affect the spiritual body, mm-hmm. conditions that affect the soul. And these conditions obviously have a different interaction with the law itself. So it's our choosing different conditions that causes the effect of thinking that the law has ramped up or not. But the reality is the law itself remains consistent and does not change at all. Mm -hmm. So there's no such thing as everyone's law of attraction being different. There's one law of attraction, God's (laughs) law of attraction, and that remains consistent and operates consistently across the universe Mm -hmm. uh, with no differences in any location. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And as we said earlier, its primary purpose is educational. Of course. Uh, yeah. yeah. So. Yeah. All right. Okay. Next thing. Um, go- all laws op- are automatic and operate without ceasing. Yes. Kind so this is sort of related to the first, yeah. but they're automatic. They don't. They have an automatic penalty. They have an automatic happiness yeah. if you follow them. Yeah. So disobedience or obedience to the law has automatic consequences, mm-hmm. and all of these consequences are automatic. They're all automated, in mm-hmm. fact, by God. So, so every single law has an automatic consequence. And yeah. isn't that wonderful? <laughs> because if, if not, it, there would be no consistency. Yeah. And if there's no consistency, that would be very unloving, very terrifying. Yeah. So, so it's fantastic that all of God's laws have that property. Yeah, yeah. Okay. All laws only have an effect when we either trigger, trigger the penalty or engage the positive effect. Yes. So this is about our sort of obedience to the law and disobedience. Yes, to the law, and we need it? to use those terms, obedience and disobedience. I know a lot of people do not like those <laughs> terms because a lot of people who are quite adverse to obedience based on their childhood and disobedience <laughs> usually resulted in uh, uh, usually indiscriminate punishment. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which I, so that causes a lot of people to... A rebellious spirit in people, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, to have a rebellious spirit towards law. But the reality is that obedience to God's laws consistently and only result in happiness Mm -hmm. and more love to be expressed. And consistently breaking God's laws, disobedience to God's laws, and even one breaking of God's laws will have its negative consequence, its penalty. Disobedience will have its penalty. And that's why, you know, we're calling the term that's now in the Bible, which is what you sow, you will reap. Mm -hmm. And it's a common term that's been used throughout history, in fact, but no one's really understood it from a law perspective very well but it is very true it's actually the law of compensation what you sow what whatever you sow right now you will reap in the future you can't hope you know physically we can't hope to sow some wheat and then you know oh halfway to through uh, the season you go oh this is a great season for corn so yeah. so let's turn it all into corn yeah. <laughs> no yeah. the genetics involved with sowing the wheat cause 
the effect, which is the wheat to grow to maturity, yeah. and we can't expect there to be a different crop. Yeah. And the same applies to our soul in terms of what it yeah. does. I think that's such a powerful, like to think about it physically, literally with an actual crop, mm. and then to think about what I physically, literally do with every day. How can I physically, literally expect there to be a different outcome exactly. in my life if I'm not sowing the right things? Yes, and this yeah. is why I think nowadays there's this t term, isn't there? If you keep doing the same thing, hoping for a different outcome, then you're stupid. Yeah, you know, yeah. In fact, they, people that's say the definition it's the definition of stupidity. of stupidity. And it is true in a lot of degrees. You, you can't expect to have your life change while you continue to do exactly the same thing. Yeah. And because there is the law that basically states what you sow now, you will reap later. You can't hope to reap something different unless change is engaged. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so just cobbling <laughs> those few first three together, mm -hmm. you, we've actually said that all laws in existence are operational all of the time. They're automatic and never cease. Mm -hmm. But, or maybe not but, but they only have an effect when we either trigger the penalty or engage the positive effect. Yes, and we have a choice at any time to engage one or the other. And, and in fact, oftentimes we are unknowingly and, and in ignorance mm -hmm. engaging laws affecting every single part of our existence, our physical body, our health, our happiness, our welfare, our, our personal joy. All, all these laws we're engaging all the time have, have effects or, that are based on the cause of us either being obedient or not obedient. Yeah. In yeah. other words, being obedient and, and going along with the law, which is not sin, mm -hmm. or being disobedient and not going along with the law, which is sin, mm -hmm. which creates a obvious penalty. Yeah. Yep. So even though we're talking about these laws and some people find it like big news that there's these laws, but actually we've been either been obeying or disobeying them our entire life Correct. and the pain and happiness that we have felt yes. in our life has all been a result yes. of either obedience or disobedience. To whether it's a physical or emotional, or spiritual or soul-based law. Yeah. And, and, you know, this is... Uh, it, it, I find it interesting that humanity generally agrees with the physical side of the laws. Mm -hmm. So our life is governed by the law of gravity and when we engage the law of aerodynamics, then it looks like the law of gravity is, is not there, but it's still there. Yeah. It's still governing our lives, but we've engaged a higher law that allows us to overcome it. But, but the two laws are still there and we didn't understand the operation of the second law for a long time in, in humanity's existence. And as a result of that, we didn't understand how to engage it. Mm -hmm. So obviously some laws, uh, we can only engage once we know them, whereas other laws have the effect that we're engaging them all the time, yeah. whether we know them or not. That's a good point. And that's really the last point, I think, of this section. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, we, we have listed as separate points. Obedience with the law always results in a loving outcome. Yeah. So um, maybe just to recap on that briefly, uh, loving outcomes are guaranteed and can cannot be avoided, mitigated or manipulated when yeah. we obey the law. Yeah, so they're guaranteed. Yeah. Like the outcome is guaranteed. Obedience guarantees a good outcome. Yeah. Guaranteed. I, I love that. <laughs> and, and I don't always experience that, but I love that. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. So, so that's the beautiful thing about it. Obviously, the opposite also occurs. Disobedience yeah. guarantees... <laughs> yes, and cannot be avoided, manipulated, a penalty that or cannot mitigated. be avoided. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So yeah. obedience guarantees happiness. Disobedience guarantees sadness and suffering. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Isn't it the wonderful? End. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it would be terrible if obedience sometimes guaranteed happiness, but other times guaranteed sadness. <laughs> it would be a terrible thing. It would. Again, it would be quite cruel. Yes. But yeah, and this is yeah. something that people don't understand about law. And we could almost say that the soul-based penalty for obeying a law is joy and happiness. Yeah, <laughs> if you can call it a penalty. <laughs> yes, I don't think we can, but... Yeah, should we, we call it a reward? A reward, yeah. The reward or the effect for a, upon the, on the soul. On the really. soul, yeah. The yeah. reward for obedience is happiness. The reward or the penalty for disobedience is sadness and suffering. Yes. And oftentimes we reap what we sow in terms of... Happy, uh, in terms happiness, of and unhappiness, and unhappiness for, for a long time, for many years to come. Don't yeah, we? so many people might stop a sin right today, 
Yeah. But because I've seen that way for 30 years, mm -hmm. so if you can mm -hmm. have an example of this, smoking, mm -hmm. smoking cigarettes. They've smoked for 30 years. They stop today. They are still, for many years to come, open to getting uh, lung diseases of some kind. Yeah. Because of the damage that they've done to their body up to that point. Yeah. And so they are still paying the penalty of the sin yeah. for a long period to come until yeah. the body is able to go through a process of recovering from that condition. Yeah. And so you can't expect to stop an action today and have an immediate cessation of the reaping of what you've done for 30 years. I often see this is in families or relationships where um, one person says, oh, yes, I've repented. I'm so, so sorry that I did this thing to you, to you say, and then, then have the expectation that that person is completely over the issue and never mentions it again and is completely fine and healed because oh, I've stopped doing that nasty thing. When if that's been a long-standing issue within a relationship, yeah. of course there's going to be... There's going to be long-standing problems yeah. that you're going to have to work through and it's going to take more than just saying, saying you're sorry too. Yes. It's going to have to take a lot of personal action, working through the actual cause and all, a lot of other things. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, a lot of people believe that they can mitigate future unhappiness by just stopping the action immediately. Yeah. But that's not true because there is the, pen the penalties carry on for many years afterwards. But, and you can understand why. Yeah. If, we, if they didn't carry on for many years afterwards, you would believe that you could start up an action and you'd have immediately the penalty and then stop the action and have immediately the undoing of the penalty. And that's not how it works. And if you think about last week's question from the other Sandra, mm -hmm. Sandra Sai, yep. she was essentially asking that, like, yeah. can I do something now and sort of Immediate. cop the penalty and then just get over it really quickly, engaging the law of forgiveness and repentance and yeah. it'll all be gone. No. And uh, yeah. So for example, not possible. a man on earth who teaches a religious untruth, like say Luther, for example, who taught a religious untruth, he is still right to this day engaging in trying to unteach the yeah. untruths yeah. to the people he started the religious Lutheran faith with. Mm because that Lutheran faith carries on to this day, yeah. the error of his, of, of his statements and teachings carry on to this day. And as a result of carrying on to this day, mm -hmm. he obviously is still, they're still dealing with the effects of the cause of the action that he took many centuries ago. Mm. Now that doesn't mean his soul is paying the penalty for it because he has gone through another process, which we'll talk about in a minute. Yes. But, but if he had only engaged the law of compensation, he would still be engaging the penalties of actions that he had taken 300, 400, you know, 300 years ago or whatever it was. I can't remember the exact time he was alive, late 16th, wasn't it, or something? Oh, and, um, search me. But, yeah. um, you know, he, he's uh, for hundreds of years been engaging these particular, these particular yeah. effects. And we only stop reaping the penalty when it is fully paid. Yes. Fully paid out like a bad debt. Yes. Oh, and oh, we get to the point somewhere. as a result that that we no longer remember that we did it from an emotional perspective. Yeah. Obviously, we remember we did it from an intellectual perspective, yeah. but we no longer have any negative emotional feelings about what we did yeah. because we know that we've paid the full penalty. Yeah. Now, someone who's taught an untruth on the planet, planet uh, I've never seen a single person who's actually taught an untruth on the planet who has, has engaged only the law of compensation and now is over what they taught. Mm. Now, I haven't seen a single person do that. Mm. All the people who taught untruth on the planet um, have had to engage a higher law in order to no longer bear the consequences of their teachings. Mm. And this is one of the things I said in the first century. It is a very serious thing to teach an untruth. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Okay, uh, final point. Um, Oh, I shouldn't speak too soon, but final point on what is about all laws. Yes. Um, any higher law always overcomes a lower law depending upon the knowledge of the law and the free will choice to do what the law demands. Yes. So if we explain that a bit more, sure. the nature of higher laws is that they can't be engaged without knowledge, knowledge. Of, of them mm. and of their purpose. Yes. 
And the nature of lower laws is that they are always engaged with or without knowledge. Yes, of course the higher laws are always engaged. In other words, if we don't understand the law of repentance, then it's highly unlikely we'll ever do anything about it. We won't do what the law demands. Mm -hmm. The law still exists yep. and, and the law could be engaged, yep. but it won't be because we don't know anything about it. Yeah. Right? Yep. Yep. And whereas the lower laws, even when we don't know anything about it, they are still operating. Yes. They're still operating upon our soul. And that, that applies to every lower law other than, uh, aside from the very highest laws, the laws of divine love. Yeah. So all of the laws of divine love must be engaged on purpose. Mm -hmm. Every other law is engaged, whether we know about we're engaging it, our engaging of it or not. <laughs> and again, I just love this design so much. Exactly. Because what I feel from that is that God's got this whole education system, this whole university of life. From mm -hmm. the minute we are, you know, born... Shoot out. <laughs> yes, that's what I wanted to say. <laughs> Delivered. Delivered. Um, from our mothers. Even before then. Even before then. As soon as we incarnate, which is very sh shortly yeah. after the moment of conception, yeah. these laws are governing our very, our very existence and our life. Our existence. And then, so we have all these kind of lower laws that pertain to physical and spiritual matter and, and then moral and ethics. They're always operating. They're always, and we're, we're having feedback constantly, whether we know the name for it or not. No. We are learning. And, you know, while we don't understand everything about the law of gravity, the first time we tried to jump off a really high thing, we learnt a lot about it. Yeah, <laughs> like, we did. Yeah. We knew. Even before then, generally. Even before then when we fell over. <laughs> you know, when we learnt yeah. how to walk. <laughs> yes, yeah. Um, and all of that I see as a part of us gaining this education in love. Yes. But also gaining an education in who we are and, and that we have a will and when we use it. And uh, also what the limitations of our physical body happens. are and what our limitations of our spirit body are yep. and what the limitations of our soul are. Yep. We find the limitations in each state because of the laws. The yep. laws allow us to find our limitations. Yes. So, so as we're going through that university, then there's like the crowning... Um, lesson that God wants us to learn about our will, yes. which is, hey, if you engage your will to really seek me and seek a the purity highest, of love, uh, the, the, highest, highest laws. the highest laws, then wow, well, I can just open up your universe even more. Yeah. Um, but you must understand this beautiful gift of will yes. that, that I've given you. So in other words, what you're really saying is that all of the lower, lower laws, and that includes all the laws right up to the laws of natural love, they they all operate whether we are aware or not, and they and by the way we should say all laws operate whether we're aware or not, but but we 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 are forced into the enga engagement of them. Mm -hmm. we, we either are obeying them or disobeying whether even we know we are or not. Yeah. Whereas the very highest laws we are automatically in disobedience with, mm -hmm. until such a time as we choose to obey them. Yeah. And, and therefore the choice to obey them requires knowledge. Mm -hmm. So the beauty of this is that we don't even get to know, we don't even get to engage the higher laws unless we want to know them. Yeah. Whereas with all the lower laws, we have to engage them whether we want to know them or not. Yeah. Right? And this is an education process again. God has not allowed the higher laws to be known unless you want to know them. Yeah. Whereas the lower laws, God allows you to know them and be affected by their operation, mm -hmm. whether you want to know them or be affected or not. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And we should say that you, it's just you, a pure will to know them, a desire to know them, isn't it? You don't need Jesus and Mary making a video, um, although that helps. <laughs> well, you know, obviously there's first people who disco discover anything. And I am certainly the first person on this planet who discovered yes. the laws regarding to those highest laws, the laws of divine love. Yeah. Now, you know, obviously, if you talk to the person who discovered the law, then it's highly likely you'll learn a lot about the law. <laughs> <laughs> a lot more rapidly, especially <laughs> Probably, if you listen. <laughs> yeah, particularly if you understand what this being said. Yeah. But um, obviously, if you don't listen to that person, you could discover the law itself. Um, but but you might find it's a lot more difficult yeah. <laughs> and a lot more time consuming perhaps, but in the end you still have the capacity to discover it. But you initially need to even understand that it, it's available. Yeah. 
And this is where I see the majority of people struggle because you, you've got to understand something is available to you before you will want to know anything about it. Yeah. And, and, the, and it's the problem of not knowing what you don't know mm. is, is, a, is a huge issue. And that requires a deep amount of humility, which most people on the planet, unfortunately, have not yet developed. Mm. And so, you know, the chances of a person doing it without assistance from other sources, whether they be sources in the spirit world or here on Earth who, who have discovered these things, um, are very, very low if humility is not present yeah. inside of the person. Yeah, mm. yeah, gotcha. Mm. Yeah. Okay, so let's talk. So that's our general. That's our general intro. Comments about yeah, about law <laughs> in general. Itself. Yeah, we do have some extra comments that relate specifically to the law of compensation and the law of repentance and forgiveness. Yes. Would you like to go through them now, or go through Sandra's? Well, I think if we go through them and then we go through Sa yep. Sandra's yep. question, yep. and then apply what we've now taught to yeah. the question, everyone yeah. will see quite clearly what's going on yes. uh, rather than sort of doing it the other way around. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> good. -o. All right. So some points about the law of compensation, mm. which is one of the laws of natural love, as we've already said. Yes. First thing, our sin is the main cause of pain and suffering, be it physical, emotional, spiritual and or soul based. Mm -hmm. Sin is the condition that causes the law of compensation to operate. Yes. Now, let's define sin. Sin is a missing of the mark of perfection, perfected love. Mm -hmm. So whenever we miss the mark of perfected love, we are sinning. Whenever we sin, we are automatically, in, we are automatically incurring the penalty of the law of compensation, compensation operating upon our soul in the particular way in which we've sinned. Mm -hmm. And it depends what we've sinned about as to what particular way we will be affected. Yeah. And we can miss that mark or sin by simply having a thought, a feeling, an intention or taking an action. Correct. Yeah. So it's very refined. It's yes. much more refined than human law. Human law basically says you can't police people's thoughts, which of course other humans of course would struggle to do. Yeah. So what they can do is only police their actions and they can only be policed after the event, mm -hmm. not as the intention. So human law basically states that unless you actually do something, you won't be punished. Whereas God laws, God's laws are not like that. <laughs> <laughs> you will actually have a penalty brought upon your soul just for the thought of doing it. Yeah. Or the desire, or more importantly, when I say the thought of doing it, we should say it's the desire to do it, yes. which is really the thought of the soul to yeah. do it. And, and if you have a desire to do something and you don't do it or you can't do it or you're limited from doing it, mm -hmm. um, it, it, it will still act upon your soul. The penalty will still act upon your soul. Yeah. And I do feel that people fall into a lot of problems here when they hear divine truth. Yep. They try to do everything backwards. They go, yes. oh, now I know all the words I've been saying and the actions I've been taking are sin. Yeah. Um, so I'm just going to reel it in from that end. I'll stop acting. I'll stop saying, and I'll try. I'll almost do nothing. <laughs> I'll just do nothing. I'll even try not to think very much or feel, yeah. because it might reveal something about me that I have to discover as another sin. Yeah, which is not the purpose of the law. It's never going to work. No. And and the law of compensation is still operating. Well, it actually has a greater operation. Yeah. Because you're limiting now yourself, so that's going to have, which is another sin, yeah. and that's going to have its own consequences. Yeah. So, so, <laughs> so in the end, exactly. you, you're making your life harder doing that, not easier. You're being less honest. Yes, yeah, so it's like desiring, uh, like a lot of people want to be perfect and then do something. Well, uh, that actually in itself, the desire to be perfect before you do something good is actually a sin in itself. Yeah. You, you, you know, you need to develop the desire. So, so rather than just wait until you've perfected and then, then desire something. Yeah. And so any person who waits is already in a state of inactivity and that has its own penalties and and in fact like i said in the previous discussion with the other Sandra last week um the the spirit world the hells themselves are full of people who have chosen ignorance mm. in, in order to avoid law yeah and that's not uh, and, and that in itself is a sin and it will have its own penalty so yeah. you can't even do that no. <laughs> it's like god, god saying sorry you're going to have to <laughs> you're going to have to take responsibility at some point yeah <laughs> Which is wonderful, really. It is wonderful. Mm. Okay. Law of compensation operates upon a soul that has sinned, is sinning, or continues to desire to sin. 
So yes. we basically just talked about that, didn't and we? And it's very important to make that distinction. The soul has sinned. Mm -hmm. In other words, they could have stopped sinning right today, yeah. but the law of compensation will still be operating upon them for the past deeds they have done. Right? So, they, so any, any way in which they have sinned in the past, will, the law will still be operating upon those particular sins. Yeah. If they are sinning right today, right, it will offer, obviously operate upon what's happening today and their future, because mm -hmm. what their, their current sin creates future events. And those particular events that are created will also have to be compensated for. Yeah. And also the future, des the desires for their future. Yeah. So, so because it's the desires that give birth to the sin yeah. and in fact are a sin in themselves. Mm -hmm. So if you desire to do something out of harmony with love in your heart, it doesn't matter whether you restrict that desire or not, there are penalties associated with the desire existing in your heart, yeah. which, you, which will come about in your future. Yeah. So it's very important to understand that how, how finely tuned this law of compensation really is. Yes. Mm. Yeah. Okay. The law of compensation has the effect of bringing the sinning soul into a state of awareness of the sin. Yes. So this is very important to understand. The law has a loving purpose. It's a redemptive purpose. The law is to bring you into a state of awareness of sin. Right. So every time you're unaware of sin and you're in denial of sin and you, you think you're not sinning, you are in, in a state where you're in denial of the mm -hmm. operations of the law and and awareness has to come about at some point in your future and the only way it can come about is through this law of compensation through understanding that everything that you have chosen to do out of harmony of love you know, not on this day and up to this point yeah. and everything you think you're going to do out of harmony of love from this point all has a consequence of which which are going to be painful for you and mm -hmm. for others and, and you need to come to understand the extent of that. And the law itself brings you to that awareness. Through the accruing of pain within yourself. Through pain and suffering. Yeah. Yes. It's a purposeful uh, system God designed to show you that if you deny awareness, then you are at some point, you're, you're going to have to become aware. And the law like law of compensation, there's a huge amount of people on the planet who deny any awareness. Mm. And the law of compensation is always working to bring them to a state of awareness, mm. right? Through pain, their own pain and the pain and suffering of the other people that they affect through their choices. Yeah. Yes, the pain and suffering that they see around them is also a part of this law, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. yeah. And what do you think about this? Um, I feel that at times, like I live with the law of compensation a lot. Mm -hmm. um, at times, the pain that I feel through ignorance of the higher laws or defiance, if you like, not ignorance. Yeah, sorry. I feel for most people it's, it is defiance, defiance. not ignorance. Yeah, yeah don't, I didn't mean ignorance. I mean mm -hmm. ignoring it, saying up yours to the law, I'm not following you. <laughs> Which is not ignorance, it's defiance. Yeah, it's defiance, that's why I changed my word. Rebellion. Uh, rebellion. <laughs> yep. Um, <laughs> And so I, I feel a lot of pain. And sometimes I've had this experience where I have a really big cry, mm -hmm. which I feel is really about just crying out compensation, crying... Um, crying in your pain. Crying in my pain. Yeah, or crying about the level of pain. Yes, mm -hmm. sometimes it's a, an acknowledgement of the amount of, of pain. pain that I'm accruing yep. through living yep. in defiance of, of, of love, law. if you like. Um, but, and maybe I'm skipping ahead, but unless I choose to start to obey some law, that cry is just really like a release valve, isn't it? And I keep moving on in life if I keep sinning. No, the cry is actually one of the compensatory effects yes. of, in other words, one of the penalties. Yes. You will create sadness and you have to cry as a result of that sadness. And that will be one of the penalties of breaking the law. Yeah. So, so yeah, a lot of people's crying it actually has nothing to do with the repentance or forgiveness, but rather with the fact that they are actually just in a cycle of paying the penalty of their prior choices and decisions, which they don't want to change. 
yeah, and that's the point I wanted to draw, that if we can cry about the compensatory pain, cry about the compensatory pain, cry about the compensatory pain. Yeah, that's not pain. forgiveness. It's not forgiveness, and it's actually not going to get us any further unless we use our will to do something different. No, and in some ways it's almost pointless. Yeah. Because, you know, while it may help us have an awareness of how much pain we're in, which is a good effect, yeah. um, if, if we choose to not change our life, mm -hmm. then, then it's had no beneficial effect in the long run. Yeah. So, so what I see a lot of people doing is they have a cry about how bad things are. They don't change their life at all. Mm -hmm. And as a result, that particular cry had no opening, did not have any effect of opening their awareness. And the law of compensation is all about trying to help you overcome, uh, uh, see you, uh, become aware. Yeah. And so obviously there will be more things you choose to do out of harmony of love, which is going to cause more actions taken that are out of harmony with love and require a penalty, which will require more sadness to be felt. Mm -hmm. And then you'll cry more. And then eventually at some point you'll cry enough to realize that, uh, hey, you need to make some different choices yeah. and take some different actions. Yes. And, and this is where, where I see a lot of people failing. They refuse to make a different choice or take a different action and, and choose love over an unloving, addictive choice or action. And as a result, the only, the, they will have continuing penalties of tears, suffering, pain, personal body pain, suffering, and a lot of other consequences until they realize that actually not only do they need to, uh, you know, understand that, you know, they're in pain, mm -hmm. but they also need to have an awareness of the pain. Uh, and part of the awareness of the pain is the awareness of the sin that causes it. Yeah. And they need to have an awareness of the sin in order for any future change to occur mm. and this is where i see most people failing when it comes to the law of compensation yeah recently we were starting to prepare the material for the assistance group on god's laws and yeah. and i said that oh my goodness if we just if people just understood these laws really the operation from us from an emotional perspective what's yes. going on yeah wouldn't need any other assistance groups no the, and we could just do this one. You could just do one group. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> but from personal experience, we have to have some emotional opening. In, of course. In and that's to, why we've planned yeah. this group to be the third one yeah. rather than the first one, because there is a requirement of having an emotional openness to becoming aware of sin in order to fully understand law. Yeah. And, and, and so, you know, yes, there is need, a need for some desire, willingness, some mm -hmm. desire to be developed to understand these things before you will engage the process of learning about them. Yeah. But the, you know, we, we could spend probably, we could spend a solid eight to 16 weeks just discussing the basics of law. Mm. And I'm talking about five hours, six hours a day for 16 weeks or so, just discussing the basics of the laws that we probably should understand if we really wanted to progress. Um, obviously, we're not going to have the opportunity to do that in our assistance groups, but mm. um, obviously it's something that we w do wish to engage in the future, a stronger, yeah. uh, so that people can understand uh, and have a much stronger understanding of law and how it affects their daily life and their personal happiness. Yeah, yeah, mm. yeah, awesome. Okay, if we never sin, the law of compensation does not affect us. Correct. The law is dependent on the existence of sin. Yes, so there's a condition um, under which many laws operate. And the condition is the conditions must be satisfied before the law is engaged. So if, if we look at, say, a, a physical law, like the law of aerodynamics, we can mm -hmm. see this truth. Yeah. We can see that unless we have a curved wing of a certain nature where mm -hmm. the area of the top part of the wing is lower than the area of the bottom part of the wing, uh, sorry, is higher than, than yeah. the area of the bottom part of the wing, which creates uh, a, basically a, a, lift, mm -hmm. a lift principle, then unless we understand that particular law, we are not going to be able to engage the law. Yeah. We're not... And, and, and it will be like the law doesn't exist to us, in fact. Yes. You know, it doesn't matter what we do. It's like the law doesn't exist. It's still there. Yeah. It's still operating. Yeah. It operates all the time. But we are just not doing anything about the understanding of it or the engagement of it, right? Yeah. So, so it also applies, this applies to all the higher laws too. So, for example, the law of compensation is a specific law that governs sin, Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a law that governs the process of sin and, and it's created to bring a person into a place of repentance, 
that's its underlying purpose. But obviously, firstly, the first part of repentance is becoming aware of the sin. Mm. And it's the law of compensation that helps you become aware of the sin. No other law does mm. this. So law. thank you, God, another for, good law. <laughs> for the law of compensation, because yeah. it helps you become aware of sin. Yeah. Now, now, if sin does not exist at all, then, of course, the law doesn't need to operate. Mm. In fact, the law, while it's still operating generally, yeah. does not operate upon your particular soul yeah. if you have not sinned. Yeah. So once you get into a state of perfection, obviously the law no longer exists to you. Mm -hmm. it, it still exists and it still operates, but it's like you're no longer governed by it because no sin exists inside of you for it to be governed by. Yeah. Yeah. So if that makes sense. So, <laughs> so. the, the sin must exist me. with inside of you for the law to act, for the law of compensation to actually have an effect on you. Mm. Yeah. Yep. Beautiful. Okay, the law of compensation will continue to make the soul aware of its sin until either the soul no longer remembers the sin. So so if we take these points one yes. at a time. So in other words, we get to the point where we've paid the penalty of sin, so, and we've paid every single penalty of the sin, and we've done it to such an extent that we no longer remember what, anymore what the sin was. But this, this from, a only, from an emotional perspective. From an emotional perspective. This only applies if we've stopped sinning, though. Of course. If we, <laughs> it's if never we, going to apply otherwise. If we keep sinning, we're going to And we're in denial of it. That's completely different. feeling the pain different. of the law. Well, even if we're aware of the sin and we keep doing it, then we actually we're there's not, even... Obviously, we remember under those circumstances, though. This statement yep. is saying that we get to a point where we no longer even remember that we sinned emotionally. Yeah. We're emo from an emotional perspective, we can't even remember what it felt like anymore. Yeah. Right? Yeah. We still remember the, 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 that we did it. What, what we did. Yeah. <clears throat> we just don't remember it emotionally. So this is what the Paget messages meant when they said for, for, forgiveness is forgetfulness. Mm -hmm. When we emotionally forget, right, then we have been forgiven for the sin. Mm -hmm. The law of compensation eventually brings us to forgiveness at some point in the sense that we are we have forgotten mm -hmm. because we've paid the penalties and we've no longer even remember what we did yeah. from an emotional perspective yeah. we no longer remember how it felt yeah. from an emotional perspective now this is very very different to denial of how it feels <laughs> <laughs> so a lot of people think they are in that state when they're not no. and and once they arrive in the spirit world usually they arrive in the hills those people and then they'll realize that maybe they've just try to hoodwink themselves yeah. rather than face the truth from the way God saw it. Yeah, mm. yeah, yeah. Okay, we'll continue to make the soul aware of its sin until the cause of the sin has been removed by yes. the sinning soul. Yes. So. And the desire to sin has also been removed. That's a very important point. The law of conversation will continue acting until the desire to sin has also been removed, which makes sense when you think about it. Because if it didn't act in that way, after it, it would stop our operating before the process had been completed of our redemption. Yes. So, so every six fear spirit who's no, who's not connected to God at all, generally, uh, it does not have a you know love based connection with God. Certainly not at one with God. Has entered this state mm -hmm. where where they no longer desire to do the same things they did on earth. Yeah. They no longer desire to sin in the same way they sinned on earth. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Or the law of compensation will continue to make the soul aware of sin, of its sin, until a higher law is purposefully engaged. Yes. So in other words, you engage, the law of compensation is about awareness of sin. After, we've start, after we start to become aware of our sin, we go, maybe there's a higher law <laughs> <laughs> that I could engage to speed up this process. And, yeah. and we go and discover that law. And once we've discovered that law and apply that law, then the law of compensation no longer needs to operate. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Which leads us to, to the laws of repentance and forgiveness. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so the now you, do you call these two laws or one law? I often think of them as one law. Well, no, they're two separate yeah. laws, really. Um, they have a relationship with each other. They are a part of the group of laws associated with God's divine love. Mm -hmm. They are still redemptive. And these are the group of laws that operate upon the sinning soul. Mm -hmm. So there's a whole heap of God's laws 
of divine love that operate upon the soul that isn't sinning anymore yes. or and is free of sin yeah. and those laws we haven't discussed but 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 these two particular laws operate upon the sinning soul mm -hmm. the soul that has sinned mm -hmm. and when i say the sinning soul as you'll see in the description it's not about the sinning soul but rather about the soul who has sinned and has now stopped sinning yes. <laughs> in fact yes. is the person that these particular laws operate upon yeah and so they're two separate actions yes repentance and forgiveness yeah so yes. the laws of repentance and forgiveness well it may be if we can describe there's two actions from our perspective and there's also uh, you know, one from God. Mm -hmm. The two from our perspective are repentance must be engaged as a personal act in terms of what we did wrong personally. Forgiveness is about what we forgive other people for what they've done wrong. Yep. So they're, they're two separate laws. They operate separately from each other, although very, they're very often joined to each other because if we can't you know, forgive other people, it's highly unlikely we can forgive ourselves. Mm. And, and also when I say forgive ourselves, it's really highly unlikely we'll repent for what we've done. Yeah. And, and if we don't repent, then it's highly unlikely that we will forgive someone else for what they've done. Yes, and, so. in, and in the process of repentance, there's often forgiveness that we must do to others that is at the cause of things that we've done, would you say? I'm um, not saying that. Yes, but, but those particular things are removed by God mm -hmm. under the operation of this law mm -hmm. rather than having to be felt by ourselves. Yeah. So, so, you know, yes. this, is, this is the operation of the law. The law allows us to engage repentance and therefore receive forgiveness from God. So, mm -hmm. so like I said, it involves two acts of our own, one mm -hmm. towards ourselves and one or about ourselves and one about other people and what we've done to them. And, and what they've done to us. Mm. And then there's the third one, which is, which is what we receive from God as a result of those particular things. Yeah, yeah. I was referring to, um, so in order to repent, uh, to, to feel about what pain I've done to others, mm -hmm. um, and, but in that process, we're likely to discover some ways that, ways that other people have harmed us that we're avoiding and acting in avoidance of forgiving that person for, I suppose, is what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. um, but forgiveness, um, it is, forgiveness is an operation still. It's still a separate act. It's yes, a separate I'll act. I'll get you now. And, and will often result from our repentance. Yeah. In fact, if we engage repentance, God's forgiveness of ourselves mm -hmm will will often result as long as we have forgiven others yes so because that's essential God of course and that's why i said God's a person who has not forgiven others will not receive forgiveness from god yeah obviously it would be hypocritical to expect god to forgive us only for us to hold on to a grudge with somebody else yeah yep. absolutely so all right let's talk about these laws yep. they operate on a soul that has sinned has stopped sinning and who sincerely desires to no longer sin. Exactly. Very important. So in other words, this soul has had be now become aware of yeah. its sin, as one of, we said in a recent pageant mentions discussion. And so the soul has become aware of its own sin. It understands what's going on now. And now it's, and the seriousness of its own sin, and it's become, or probably in this stage, also become aware of the consequences of the sin mm -hmm. and as a result has decided through the use of will soul-based mm -hmm. will to to stop engaging in sin obviously it's going to be quite hard unless the cause of the sin is removed but but at this stage even though that's hard they have they've stopped sinning they yeah. they no longer want to perform the sin there's a deep soul-based desire to no longer sin in that in that way yeah ever ever yeah. ever okay Repentance has the effect of God forgiving the soul who sinned and removing the effect of the sin by removing the sin's cause. Yes. God can never remove the effect on somebody else, though. Um, well, of course God can if they engage the process. Yes, yeah, sorry. <laughs> God can always do that, but we, their will has to be engaged. Yeah. Just the principle of this particular, uh, all of the laws of divine love all revolve around the gift of free will. Mm -hmm. So, so we can't we can't refuse the engagement of our will 
and expect these laws to operate. Yeah. These laws depend upon the full engagement of our will. Yeah. Yep. Sorry, I shouldn't. I don't want to muddy that point. Let's just because I jumped to another right. thought. Um, so basically, it has the effect when I repent, God forgives my soul who has sinned, my sinning. Let's just say me. Just me forgives me my for sin. sin. Forgives my sin. Yeah. And also removes its cause. The cause of the sin. Now that that is a very that's a very hard thing to do otherwise. Trust, if anybody knew how hard that was, really, um, you know, there's people in the spirit world who have, enga- have engaged that process, who are now living in the sixth dimension of the spirit world and, and know that it's quite a difficult process. <laughs> to remove the cause of sin without repenting. <coughs> yes, to remove the cause of sin without repentance is a very long, time-consuming and quite a lot of pain and suffering process yeah. to engage. Yeah. People have done it. They haven't removed all sin, of course, because mm-hmm. they haven't removed the sin of the Holy, against the Holy Spirit, yeah. which is a sin directly towards God, uh, denying, uh, denying God's love, and, uh, and often God's existence too, but, but God's love primarily. And, um, you know, that particular sin has its own very, very great penalties. In fact, it is the biggest sin we can actually commit mm. because it has the most harmful effect on our life for the rest of our existence. Yeah. It limits us to the sixth dimension when we could be progressing through spheres, you know, as far as we're aware, there are possibly infinite amount, a number of different better conditions. And, and, you know, it prevents us from growing through those particular conditions. Yeah. So it has the most detrimental effect to our lives. The sin against the Holy Spirit is the biggest possible sin we can engage, and that's the sin of not wanting to receive God's love. Mm. Okay. If we never sin, the law of repentance and forgiveness does not affect us. The law is is dependent on the existence of sin. Yes, so remember these two particular laws of God's love operate upon the sinning soul. Mm -hmm. Of course, there are a lot of laws of God's love that operate upon the soul that isn't sinning. Yes. But these particular two laws are uh, assisting the soul to become become redeemed. They are about our redemption from sin to a state of perfection. And so these particular two laws govern the redemption from the condition of sin. And so that means then that once we are no longer in a condition of sin, then these two laws no longer have a cause to operate. They still operate generally, yeah. but they no longer have a cause to operate upon our soul specifically. Yeah. So just to clarify, you said these laws, forgiveness and repentance, pertain to the sinning soul, but really it's the soul who has sinned but has chosen not to correct. anymore. Correct, yeah, we need to yeah. be more correct just, there. Just be it's not to the that. sinning soul, it's no. to the soul that has sinned yes. and no longer desires it. Yes. You know, so... And this is so important, isn't it? Because I, I feel like a lot of times, um, I can include myself in that, we become aware of sin through the law of compensatory effects. Yes. Compensation. We have an and awakening to it and all of its effects and its pain and its suffering and everything about it. Yep. But we cannot start to engage the law of repentance and forgiveness until we not only stop the sin, but we really desire to, we'll, to no longer do it. To no longer do it. Do it. Yeah, to no, no longer. longer. As a feeling. As not, a f- and that's, that's called the soul's thought. Yeah. So we need to understand that every time the Paget messages, for example, refer, refer to thoughts, the, the, the spirits talking are referring to the soul's thoughts. Mm-hmm. And the soul's thoughts are feelings. Yeah. They're all feelings. Yeah. They're all emotions. So, so we need to understand that we need to have, no longer have a desire, an emotion that we want to do it. Yes. So, so sorry, otherwise, you know, we're, we're still really desiring sin. Exactly. And I see a lot of people trying to jump to, to engage in the law of forgiveness and repentance when they have not yet had the desire, the soul-based thought that I no longer want to do this. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And it's impossible. Yes. Yeah. And, and honestly, until we see the seriousness, and to, see, if we truly had an awakening to sin, then of course we'd no longer want to do it. Yeah, exactly. So, so the true awakening to sin demands that we no longer want to do it. Yes. Even if it, we feel drawn to doing it, we'd no longer want to. Yes. Does that make sense? 
Yeah, I so, do. I do really see that yeah. in myself as well. And I, I, wherever I am starting to become intellectually aware of a sin or, or have some feeling of pain about a sin, I know that I haven't fully recognised the full sin of it yeah. until I really want to cease it. Yes. Because... Yep. And it's, it's the obvious. desire to cease it that drives the engagement of the law of repentance. Mm. Because it's the desire to cease it, knowing how bad the consequences have been, not only to yourself, but also to others, and in particular to others. It was, you know, it's bad enough when you've had consequences in, you know, upon yourself, but when you've had consequences upon others who have not deserved these particular things to occur to them, then yes, you, you, know, you feel it's true nature of the law how great it is like how great how great the sin is yeah. when whenever we've damaged other people we, we you know it's a very once you really recognize how much you've damaged other people you you definitely would have the feeling of never wanting to do it again ever yeah. Yeah. and even though you might feel drawn at sometimes to do it um, which is about the cause of the sin remaining within you mm -hmm. you would still you'd be fully awakened to the effect and therefore no longer want to do it yeah. and no longer do it, in fact. Yeah. You'd rather remove yourself from the situation than do it. Yeah. yeah. And this is why the law of compensation serves such an important purpose, doesn't yes. it, to make us aware of the yes. level of our sin. And, and it's also why God's Holy Spirit can't connect while we're not aware. Yeah. And it's also why God's love can't flow while we're not aware. We have to go through the awareness process first. Mm -hmm. And that has to, you know, if we engage that by choice, Yep. That is much better than having it forced upon us, obviously. And uh, it's going to might take a much longer time if it's forced upon us than if we engage it by choice. Mm. So, Which so. we have to remember in the discussion of Sandra's question. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, we're nearly done with the, we're nearly with done the preamble. With the preamble. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, yeah. if we choose to repent, we engage the laws of forgiveness and repentance and the law of compensation ceases to act upon our soul due to the cause of the sin being removed. Correct. So, so once we engage the law of repentance, the law of compensation really is of no longer any consequence to us, even though it still exists and it still operates for everyone. It's not operating for us because the conditions within us, within our soul, have changed. Mm -hmm. And the conditions of change are now we're repentant. And that has caused a change within our soul that no longer means the law of compensation can operate. And, and in fact, the law of repentance and forgiveness is now in full operation. And as a result of the removal of the cause of sin within us, we will, in fact, no longer sin either <laughs> in the end. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So that's the operation of that law. Yeah. Mm. Fantastic. Okay. We go through Sandra's email. There's a lot more we can say, of you... course, about the laws. But <laughs> well, this is why we're having a <laughs> This is a just week. a brief introduction uh, yeah. <laughs> to the subject, just so that we can answer Sandra's <laughs> question. <laughs>